All right, here we go. All right. Welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. I'm here with my good buddy, Mr. Yevgeny Chabotarov. He is uh, back from, geez, where were you? You were you were across the several ponds over in China, right? What was going on there, man? Yeah, I, well, I came back from Italy uh, last night. Uh, and before that, I was in Germany, and before that, I was in China. Um, so there's been quite a few countries that I've visited. You're just um, a world trap. What's up with that? How do you get this? <laughs> what, what kind of founder gets to travel the world like that? Should you I, be stuck in a cubicle somewhere doing meetings or something? <laughs> uh, that was what I was doing for the first four years. Yeah. And uh, I guess I got lucky. Uh, yeah. I, you know, one of the good things is hiring people smarter than you so that you can do the things that you love doing. So yeah. for me, that's meeting our community and uh, just going places and uh, taking photos, uh, talking about foreign PX, talking about startups, uh, the struggles of startups. Obviously, it doesn't sound like that when, when, when you hear me travel. Yeah, uh, yeah but, the struggles but, yeah. Of, of living in, in five-star hotel rooms, man. I know. I gotta, <laughs> I'll send you a care package or something. <laughs> I, th I think I should start sharing photos of my hotels. Uh, sometimes they're not what they seem. So it's kind of like it goes from uh, really fancy hotels sometimes to really, really crappy ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you never know. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't imagine. But I, I can a little bit. All right, man. Well, so, all right. So first of all, just on this show, this is a little bit different for This Week in Photo. We, it's just you and I right now doing the show, which I think is kind of cool. So you and, I, you and I get to tackle the stories of the week but, and then talk a little bit about 500px as well because there's been lots of changes happening over there and there's a reason why you were over in China or Shanghai. Um, but let's start. Before you tell me the reason why you, why you were there, there's been uh, some news. You guys made a little bit of a change graphically with your corporate mm -hmm. identity, and it has polarized a lot of your users in some ways. Some people right. love it to death, and some people are like, what the heck were you thinking, man? Absolutely, so, yeah. So we, we, we changed our uh, logo, and we, we kept the name, but uh, after six years, uh, you know, I think it's... People hate change, right? Like when oh, yeah. something changes, people uh, don't like it. They want things to stay the same. But for yeah. us, it's kind of like the opposite. We are we are always changing, and we told everyone every time we do something that it's never over. That it's going to be more changes coming soon. Yeah. So whatever you see now, there's going to be more and more changes every few months, or like you know, as as soon as we have them ready. Uh, because I think that's a part of the startup life uh, where yeah, you have absolutely. to where you have to move because uh, you know uh, if not you'll be you'll be happy with uh, GeoCities. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember GeoCities. Right? Yeah, yeah. They absolutely. were that that was my first website. But if I would be satisfied with that, we would never move forward. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's important to to see that. Um, and with the logo, we wanted to have kind of like a new identity to represent what we. Uh, stand for as a more inclusive community, as the personal expression, um, as the uh, what I call a creative identity. That's why it looks like a fingerprint of sorts. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, it totally does. I'm gonna pull it up right now. Yeah, so there's a little bit of um, things that we try to combine in the in the login. We, uh, we worked with a company to help us with that. So uh, it will take time to uh, to get used to the change. So I think you know maybe. Uh, in three to six months, uh, it would be nice to go back uh, and and compare it to the old log and be like, well, you know, what do you think now? For example, S same with with like Google and everybody else. First, it's polarizing, and then like a year later, you just don't even notice that. <laughs> so you kind of get used to it after a while, right? Yeah. So, uh, so, so I'm sharing. I just did a quick Google search. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. I just Google search yeah. uh, 500px logo. Yeah, so so the first one that you hovered over, um, it, it, Daily Smart for the Digest, that is from 2009. That is how old it is. So that's kind of wow. like, uh, because in the beginning, uh, we were thinking of 500px as the photo digest that will give you the best content uh, based on the best photos and best photographers out there. 
uh, and it's been evolving. So now it's a uh, photo community in the marketplace. So it's kind of like it's it's more than what it used to be. Um, so I think we're we've grown up quite a bit. Um, yeah, and that reflects. I the, do like the infinity thing, though. I'm gonna miss that. Being, oh, me, me too. I mean, uh, I, like, it's either infinity. When I looked at it, I either yeah. saw infinity or I saw like a mask. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but but the the fun thing we're compiling uh, some great uh, mockups uh, and parody on the new logo. So there's going to be a really fun blog post in the in the next uh, few days or weeks uh, when w people are making some crazy stuff with the logo and comparing to a lot of different things. So it's always fun to see uh, kind of like where people's creativity will will take us. Yeah. Oh, I think we have... Uh, hey, oh. Nicole, there you are. Hey, Nicole, we had a show notes mix-up. <laughs> welcome welcome to the show. We're already in progress. You're joining... Oh, you're, thanks. <laughs> you're joining... I'm in, like, I'm in like, fi like last-minute study mode because I, like, just now got all the info I needed, so... Oh, no worries, no worries. We had, <laughs> we had a, a last-minute kerfluffle, so... <laughs> That's all right. I can deal with kerfluffles. You're all yeah. good. You're all good. So, well, welcome Nicole Young to the show. We we you. just started a minute ago. I'm I'm grilling Yevgeny about <laughs> the controversy around his change to the 500 px logo. <laughs> so, hey, so let me plug it. I need to hold on. I need to get into my headphones here. Yeah, go for it. So, Yevgeny, I've got okay. up. I've got the uh, the your brand new logo up, and I can see how it kind of looks like a fingerprint now. So, yeah. so yeah. take me through that. So, what was the what was the impetus, and and who designed this, and where did it come from? Um, I forgot the company we worked with, actually. I think it was Focus Labs, uh, but I'm probably the uh, the worst person to talk about the logo, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the, the main change is that we wanted to bring something that is open and mm -hmm. easier, uh, especially not the logo type, but the word mark, uh, the one that you see below on the left. Yeah, uh, this guy. Now yeah. it reads 500px instead of 5 infinity. So for a lot of people, uh, for a lot of years, people would uh, refer that to like 5 infinity, 500, 500px, 500 pixels, yeah. uh, 500 pix. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that it's clear how it's uh, supposed to be uh, pronounced and how it's supposed to be said. So now it's clear that it's 500px. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's kind of like the main. Uh, basically the main logo that we're going to be using uh, everywhere and then where we need to have uh, uh, a mark we'll use the uh, uh, what I call the, the creative identity mark that looks like the fingerprint yeah very cool that's that's not a small undertaking changing a logo I mean that's all, all your wonderful, awesome business cards. By the way, thank you for pointing me to the company that designed your business cards because yeah. I've used them and they made the awesome Twip business cards. Nice. But, but now they get more business from you because <laughs> you need to re you yeah, redesign. It's a, it's a huge change, and uh, obviously we knew what we were getting to. That is like a multi-month effort. Yeah. Uh, but I think... It, you know, I think in three months we will know that it's it was worth it. Uh, and now I'm still getting some messages that where people are missing the old logo and they're saying like, oh well, uh, I really like the infinity and the uh, uh, you know like a few things because you're obviously like uh, you're uh, you know a lot of people grew up with that logo basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And now that it's changed, uh, it takes some time to get used to it. So, yeah. Well, whatever, I'm, like, yeah. It's brave to make any kind of change, especially when you have a rabid fan base. <laughs> so Absolutely. Making, yeah. Yeah. making so, any kind of change is going to bring out the hornets. And yeah. From and what I read online, yeah. they yeah. came out, yeah. right? And I hear those immediately. Like five seconds later, somebody on my Facebook would message me and be like, hey, <laughs> let, me, <laughs> let me tell you straight. So it's really nice to hear from people uh, to be uh, honest and straightforward for a lot of things. Yeah. Um, and I really appreciate it for everybody who reached out and uh, you know shared their thoughts, whether positive or negative. So, yeah. so let, let me translate. Them, let me yeah. translate for you, Guinea, <laughs> into like what I would say if I was CEO. I would say, thank you for your input, but enough. We're changing it. It's not going to go back. Enjoy it. This is what it is. And we may change it again in the future. And, you know. I, I think that this is part of your story where the company actually changed something and then had to revert back. So I think yeah. we'll hear that and uh, discuss that story 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We do have another story like that, don't we? <laughs> yeah. So before we get to that, Nicole S. Young finally Hello. got the show notes finally in the finally house. Got, yes, you. I got everything. <laughs> thank you, thank yes. you for coming on. Sorry for the uh, the mix. A little up. bit, a little bit of pain. I probably should have messaged you earlier, but I was like, I know it'll show up eventually. <laughs> no, I was running behind too, so it, it was one of those perfect storms. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> That's all right. So what's going on? Oh, yeah. I, you know, today I had a really good day shooting with some friends. Um, just been kind of doing my thing, writing a new ebook, and what am I not though? I'm always, yeah. I'm always working on something. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's a uh, we've got a ton of stuff to talk about in in tonight's show beyond 500 Pixels new logo and Yevgeny. Oh, Yevgeny! Before we before we move on, so you we mentioned that you were in China. Well, mm-hmm. Why were you in China? <laughs> so, so um, I know you revealed it to me. So I'm putting you on the spot to reveal it right. to the audience. I, I was in China for two completely separate reasons. Uh, reason number one: we were having a global photo walk, uh, and I was joining the chapter of this photo walk in Hong Kong with a great photographer, Peter Stewart, who was there at the time. Um, I'm happy to say that this is uh, the largest photo walk in the world in its just third year. So we actually mm-hmm. broke an uh, incredible record of 30,000 people going out and shooting on one day, basically like creating a snapshot of the world. A day in the life. On day in life of the world on September 26. That's um, awesome. And that That's is awesome. incredible to see all the photos all over the world. Well, was that bigger? Was that, I know Kelby and team, they do their worldwide photo walk too. Did you blow them out of the water? Uh, we did, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Scott Kelby, guess what? <laughs> we we uh, we did, and uh, I'm proud of the team. We worked pretty hard on uh, on on all the members that joined. So it's, it, I mean, like it, it's not a competition, right? So it's 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 both. It's not, but it is. Yeah. B- b- <laughs> both are free events. Both are. Uh, to celebrate the community, so it's 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 kind of like it's the same community that goes out uh, to Scott Kelby's photo walk and to ours photo walk. Yeah. Um. It ju- yeah. It's just nice to it's be. It's awesome. Yeah. It's yeah. You're right. You know. No. It's all in good fun. When I say you know Scott Kelby, look it, out. It, but, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's all. It's like podcasting, right? Yeah, There's a million yeah. podcasts, and Absolutely. I encourage people to listen to other podcasts as well. Twip is not the only one out there. It's, it's like doing multiple photo walks and, and participating. It's more important to get out there and click your shutter than to worry about allegiances and all this crazy stuff. So, so who is your arch uh, ne- nemesis in the podcast world? You know, I'm go- I'm going <laughs> who, after who, CNN. Who you can who can you CNN. CNN. <laughs> CNN. CNN. I'm coming after you, and then I'm going after the BBC. Nice. <laughs> after I crush you. Nice. <laughs> I think no, that's no. basically within the reach uh, of this <laughs> podcast. You uh, know, I, I I tend to take a different tack on it. I don't think I have any competition because there is only one Frederick, there's only one Twip, there's only one you guys that bring your flavor to the show, and we have a we have our unique dynamic. So we're you know there's really no competition unless another unless I start another twip and then it'll comp- compete with this twip so that's that's how i see like every everything i do too you know it's like i might write a book on i don't know pick a subject but just because somebody else writes a book on it doesn't mean that people won't buy both of them like food stars is a great example everybody has a different perspective a different personality and it's you know i encourage people to find outside sources for everything and it's i think yes. that people respect other companies when they do that instead of trying to push them down, you know, when somebody pushes something down because they feel like they're a comp- competition, it just makes them look smaller, so. Yeah, you know, I think yeah, just totally. people gravitate to certain things and certain, uh, certain people, so uh, yeah. whatever. Yeah, the exactly, people have different tastes. Some people mm-hmm. don't want to listen to Twip because of certain reasons and other people do, you know, that's the whole thing. As l- my advice to people would be, if you're buy the biggest capacity phone you can next time you update next time you update don't cheap out and buy a 16 gigabyte phone buy a 128 gigabyte phone you know especially if you're getting a phone that shoots 4K and then you'll be able to consume all the music and <laughs> podcasts and apps and all that stuff you and keep about. every single episode of Twip <laughs> exactly <laughs> all yeah, the phone yeah you don't want to do that <laughs> All right, guys, let's dive in uh, to the show. We've got a ton of stuff to talk about. First, story number one is about the United States, the FAA. Um, They're planning on creating a drone registry in response to safety concerns around 
irresponsible drone pilots doing crazy things with them. So it's supposedly uh, to be unveiled this week. I'm not sure if it got unveiled yet or not as we go to record this, but it's the, let me read this from the show. So the drone users in the U.S. will soon be required to register their aircraft drones with the Department of Transportation, DOT, in an attempt to address safety concerns over the growing number of unauthorized flights. The register uh, or registration to be unveiled Monday, which is today as we record this, comes in response to concerns about a surge in incidents where drones have flown over or, or near airports and crowded public venues. The announcement is expected to be made by the U.S. Treasury Secretary Anthony Fox and Michael Huerta, Administrator of the FAA, at a news conference attended by drone industry figures. So this, this is interesting, and I wanted to talk to you guys about it specifically because, A, it's This Week in Photo, and this happened this week, but B, drone photography in general is becoming and has become in the past 18 months a complete new genre of photography, and the government is now being forced to react accordingly as people do stupid things like fly them near aircraft and into the White House and into the heads of brides and stuff like, stuff like that. Nicole Young, uh, you know, you saw this, right? You read this article. Yeah. I personally, I think this legislation is good. I mean, it's it's we need some kind of oversight in the in the space before people start running amok. On the other hand, I'm thinking, you know, how do you how do you police something like this yeah. when people are airborne by the thousands and you only have so many people to police them? What do you think? Well, it's it's kind of funny that we're talking about drones again because the last time I was on Twip, it was like the whole episode <laughs> felt like we were talking about drones. So, yeah. um, so it's still kind of fresh in my mind. You know, I don't do drone photography. I don't have a drone, uh, you know, quadcopter, whatever you want to call it. I'm ordering one this week, just yeah. for the record. I'm I, ordering a so Phantom So now you'll, you'll have a first, you know, you'll be able to tell us how the, all this works. So yep. I think a lot of it comes down to what they ca consider a drone. Like, you know, I mean, you could consider a helicopter, like a wireless remote, whatever, helicopter to be a drone because it flies mm -hmm. in the air. So mm -hmm. what's their classification, first of all? And how easily or difficult is it for people to register? You know, can they just do it quickly online? Do they have to pay something? Right. Or is it just like real quickly, enter it in, enter the manufacturer, enter the serial number, you know, maybe verify your address and that you're, you're wherever you live or however they want to do it. If they make it like convoluted and way too much effort and way too much energy, then it's it's going to obviously that's going to cause problems. So I think it's a good thing because there's so much, you know, unfortunately, you kind of have to go to the lowest denominator and the person who's making all the mistakes, you kind of have to yeah, pretend, you, assume you, you that everyone's going to do that. that. Yeah, exactly. Has the potential it's for, it's for the lowest everything. common denominator. Yeah, it's really what, sad. What I worry about is you know, if, like you said, if they make it convoluted, no one's going to do it, you no, know, and they're just exactly. going to say, you know what, what's, what's the ticket I could get? You know? yeah, yeah, what's the penalty for that? Is it yeah, be if like, I get a penalty, no, it's, it's, a, it's a hundred dollar fine, I'm just going to go fly until I get caught, you know. <laughs> <don't do laughs> like, like people, I mean, the, the thing is, you're probably only going to get caught if you do something stupid and get in trouble with it, you know, right. I mean, like they're going to walk around, like police officers are going to walk around and check your registration for your drone if you're in a, a public yeah, area or whatever. That's what they're getting at, because even then... <laughs> If you're if you're in one of these awesome drones like D, like the Phantom Three that I'm gonna order, right? Mm -hmm. That thing, Eric Chang was telling me this earlier this week that I could go a mile out with that thing. Jeez. <laughs> and be looking at the video on my iPad. So how they can even? Going. Yeah. So then how are? Oh, yeah. yeah what if, down, what if, check yeah, registration. But <laughs> if if yeah. I'm a mile away yeah. and I'm like I do something stupid, I'm like, hey, look at that, look at that car. I'm gonna crash my drone into that car, <laughs> and I crash it into that car. Then what? Right? If it's not registered, then if it's not registered, unless, yeah. you know, if they if, no, if they if they do it through, let's say DJI, if DJI has to do something where every time you purchase it, you have to automatically register it at the time of purchase, you yeah, know, yeah. that it gets that tied would, to your serial your the yeah. serial number gets tied to your credit card, which yeah. is trackable and all so that. So yeah. in a way, it would you know, I think for the consumer, now people might not be happy that they have to register, but if it's law, then it's law and if it's already taken care of before they even get it in their hands, then that might make kind of solve that whole convolution, you know. So it'll be interesting how they implement it. I think that's usually mm -hmm. 
I'm excited. Okay. I'm excited yeah. to see how they implement it. It's, it's it's like a new era in law, right? This is like yeah. brand new territory. New frontiers. <laughs> yeah. You've given, what do you think about this? I mean, is this the uh, well, is this the new war on drugs? The new war on drones? <laughs> well, let me start with, with the personal story. Two days ago, we were shooting uh, drone footage in Vienna, Italy. Um, and we were in the main square, and a friend of mine, he's like, well, should I fly here? I'm like, um, there's some police officers, so I don't want you to be caught while you are launching the drone. So we went to the, basically, as you said, a mile away, uh, about 800 meters, uh, to the complete separate part of town uh, on a big parking lot, and then we launched the drone and just like flew it back to the main square, shot everything we wanted to shoot, yeah. Uh, I had to Google the height of the tower uh, so that we would fly over that for sure. Yeah. Um, and like basically had amazing footage, but uh, half a mile away from uh, uh, from uh, from the place. The thing is, I think that the the onus is on the on the manufacturers like DJI, who are the undisputed leader of drones right now. Yeah. To actually have uh, uh, what they currently have is no fly zones. So a lot of airports, you cannot even fly your your DJI Phantom Three into the airport because it wouldn't it wouldn't let you. Right. Because it has the GPS and some coordinates that are part of the kind of like no fly zone list. So I think it's kind of like should be reversed because there's going to be uh, DJI sells thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of drones each year. Uh, and it's that number will just keep going up every year until everybody is like uh, have at least one drone at home. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's on them to actually kind of like police that by ensuring that every uh, you know if you don't want to fly it over the uh, shopping malls, then the shopping malls are on the no fly list, for example. Or if you don't want to fly it over uh, obviously airports or. Uh, U.S. military or like not a U.S. military, like any military options. Any, just any place <laughs> like where no, you no, should, no. Right. yeah, airports, all that stuff. And they should, yeah. I think they should, and I don't know, you know, we have to talk to Eric or drone officials about this, but I think they should also have some sort of device where they can give to law enforcement and emergency workers and any other place where people want to control the airspace that they can turn it on and create a bubble no-fly zone that, that drones just... I don't know if you can do that, but that they can't at least take off into it. Right? Think, maybe, but then imagine you want to have, like, to every, then you will have, what, like, every police officer with a special device of creating a bubble of no-fly zones? Yeah, and then that would get <laughs> hacked, and then there'd yeah, be... Yeah, uh, yeah. It seems uh, uh, like an overkill, but at yeah, the same time, yeah. uh, you, you cannot stop that. Like, you, uh, there's... Uh, uh, I, I, I probably know half a dozen of people who are building their own drones. They yeah. don't have any no-fly restrictions. Mm -hmm. no. no, they can go anywhere they want. Yeah, You can build a drone. I saw a drone at, geez, what was it, CES last year. I don't even know if you can call it a drone because it was... <laughs> It was the size of a Prius, you know, and it was designed for Spaceship. like airlifting victims, you know, and it was a relief type thing that was all, you know, that you could fly in and take people out on stretchers and stuff like that. And I'm like, that thing was huge, you know. And if imagine something like that, we're talking about these little uh, semi toys. Mm -hmm. When you get to that level, you could put anything you want on this thing and fly it anywhere you want, anytime you want to fly it. So the technology is out of the bag, right? Yeah, but at the same time, I think uh, part, part of that is the weight restrictions, right? If you're mm -hmm. buying Phantom 3, maybe you just buy it and you use it. This is a toy, right? This is a yeah. recreational use. But if you're mm -hmm. a professional filmmaker and you have an octocopter mm -hmm. with a bigger camera and, like, uh, operator and uh, a pilot, uh, it's usually, like, a couple of people in those uh, pro drones. Yeah. Uh, and th this becomes like a commercial thing, like a helicopter, basically, and it can create real damage. So maybe you need like a real flight permit. And I think that that that's uh, that's the issue that uh, FAA was trying to tackle before yeah. uh, by giving licenses to commercial drones. Uh, but this is just on the real forefront of technology. Um, and frankly, I'm not that worried because. Um, uh, I've been to Iceland a few months back, 
-hmm. And imagine you're standing with like 300 photographers shooting some icebergs or whatever, and the only three drones in the air are the drones of uh, me and my friends. <laughs> That's it. So like that out of 300... Change. Yeah. You know, because what if drones go the way of the selfie stick? Yeah. You know, because I remember a couple of years ago, you see one every now and then. Yeah. Now they're everywhere. You know, they 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 multiply like rabbits. So you know that may change. But it you feels know. like you know it's still so far in between. So uh, in Italy, uh, in even the most touristy places, we were the only one with a drone. So yeah. It, yeah. Se it seems like yeah, there's people like Elia that is flying drones everywhere. Eli Lacari, uh, uh, like doing all the crazy stuff, uh, and some other people, but yeah. I, I think it's still so far in between that it's not even. Uh, uh, there's probably more drones being crashed than there's owned uh, each year so far. So it's yeah. kind of like uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. But you know what? You know the good thing is. Um, uh, one of my good friends is Eric Chang, who mm -hmm. used to work for DJI. He announced last week that he had departed DJI. We actually recorded a whole interview that's going to go live on the TWIP network next week. But I, I contacted him yesterday, asked, and I said, hey, can you give me some comments on this whole you know, FAA announcement, which hasn't occurred yet, obviously, so he couldn't, com <laughs> so he couldn't comment on it. But he and I are going to sit down uh, Wednesday of this week and a couple days after we record this, and he's going to give me a couple of thoughts. And I'll, you know, if and I'm taking a risk here, if I have been able to contact Eric and talk to him in the future, I will insert his comments <laughs> here. All right, that was Eric Chang's comments on the FAA's hopefully. announcements. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. If not, you didn't hear anything. You know, but <laughs> if I was able to talk to Eric, I've inserted it in the, you know, post-mortem <laughs> into the show through the wonders of post-processing. Post All right, but you know, speaking of the FAA, so here's another statistic from the FAA. So they said in uh, between January 1st and, and the 9th of August there were reported more than 650 unauthorized drone sightings. I don't know what sightings mean. You know, unauthorized drone sightings in that window uh, between the 1st of January and the 9th of August compared to 238 in all of 2014. So basically they're extrapolating if, if the sightings, so what is a sighting? If the sightings continue at that rate, the number will near 1,100 by the end of the year. So, I mean, an unauthorized un 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 drone sighting, was it on, that's like a UFO? <laughs> yeah, what if it is an authorized drone sighting? Like, what is going on? Like, how do you, yeah, how do you, what's an authorized drone sighting? Like, <laughs> look at that one, it's blinking green instead of red, you know? <laughs> What is that? I don't know. It's it's yeah. It's really hard to um uh to have all this like government uh legalese and speak. Yeah, it's it's so. tough. It's tough. Yeah, and I'm I'm particularly interested in this because I'm heading off to Vietnam next month, and I'm buying this Phantom Three and a case and all the doohickeys that go with it to take with me. Hopefully, you know, I'll be able to get it in country and all that, so I can do some you know some shots from the air in Vietnam. So all this stuff, I'm researching the you know the law in Vietnam around flying these things and where I can and can't fly them, and this this FAA ruling is coming down just as I'm about to pull the trigger because <laughs> I've been saving all year to buy this thing. <laughs> now I'm getting it, and this ruling comes down just before I'm getting ready to push buy, you know, on DJI site or on Amazon. So you know, it's it's all interesting. I'm gonna document the whole thing and let you guys, you know, the TWIP listeners know what my experiences were because this is like. Yeah, I think it's all historic because this this ruling is coming down right now, and it's my first time in Vietnam, so we'll see how it I goes. I love it. Oh, it's like one of my favorite places in the South, Southeast Asia. So. Oh, I gotta pick your brain for it. real. I'm I sure. need to pick your brain on what to bring with me, what not to bring. <laughs> you know what? The most thing, the thing I'm most worried about, Nicole, hmm? food. <laughs> Oh well, I'm a pretty adventurous eater. So. I don't want to get sick because I'm 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 a Midwestern kid. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, Vietnamese I is my one of my favorite cuisines. So mm -hmm. like that's all I'm eating when I'm back home, basically. Good. So Good. <laughs> you're, you're gonna are be you, fine. Are you worried about getting sick, or are you just worried about the types of foods that you'll get? 
Well, like, I mean, you... I'm not a I'm not an adventurous eater to begin with, but uh, I can I can eat you know almost anything. But I'm not gonna eat fine. weird weird stuff. But I'm just worried about eating something that has some kind of you know something in it that Don't my body's it. not used the, to having, and the... then I'm gonna be in my hotel room. You know. But the first, so this is like <laughs> specifically a... my hotel room toilet. You know? <laughs> This is, four years ago was my first like going out and traveling by myself, and Vietnam was the first place that I picked to go to. And mm -hmm. the first meal that I had was sitting down and getting like street food from some random lady, and this huge she had this huge pot, you know, of just I don't know, I don't even know what I ate. I was eating, I was like, I don't know what that is, I don't know what that oh is, <laughs> mystery meats, and I was fine. I was fine. I grew up in the Midwest too, but I've definitely outgrown that <laughs> the Midwest yeah. eating a lot. Very, I'm much more an adventurous eater, but um. You'll be fine. Just bring, you know, bring what what's emodium? <laughs> emodium AD? Yeah. Yes. Bring yeah. that just in case because you never know. A couple, a couple of gallons of that I'll bring along. <laughs> <laughs> it's always smart. Always travel with that anyways. But yeah. Yeah. You'll be yeah. Fine. I mean, I'm, no no disrespect against Vietnam because like I went to Hawaii and I ate something weird and mm, I was in anywhere. my hotel room for a couple hours. <laughs> it can happen in your hometown. It can happen anywhere. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. But that I'm excited. I'm going to pick your brain offline sure. about that. Cause Absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm doing the whole what what should I not bring? Cause <laughs> I'm like I'm going light, man. I'm going mm -hmm. Derek Story nimble photography style out there. A, you and know? and a drone and a drone. <laughs> and maybe a drone, yes. Maybe a drone. Hey, what are you bringing? What camera uh, are you bringing? I'm bringing my uh, my Panasonic G7 and maybe a GH4 with nice. me. And then I'm I'm trying to cut it down to maybe three lenses. You know, maybe not even that, but Good. like just. Just a there, couple. There of is them. one uh, good backpack that uh, uh, I think Tank makes, Airport mm. Accelerator, I think, oh. uh, and it can carry your drone, DJI Three, fits in there. Uh, okay. It can carry two cameras and a couple of lenses. Oh, all in one. So I need that. It's the accelerator, Airport Accelerator. Yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it's Airport Accelerator. The one that doesn't have the uh, wheels, so it has slightly more capacity than the wheeled one. Okay. Um, and it's just, uh, it's just excellent because like you have ev everything that you carry on is like all your. And gear, it's a, Is it backpack style? Yep. Yeah. Yes. You'll probably right. also want like a tr you know walk around town bag too, like a messenger bag or something. Yeah, so. I'm trying to get the I'm trying to get those Peak Design folks to send me one of those. Bags. I know those look so beautiful, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll. I'm I've been waiting forever. I'm I, it's like a unicorn. <laughs> I just bought a I just got an Ona bag, a really small one. I can't remember what kind it was, like Bowery or something. And uh, I'm gonna try that because I've got a trip to Italy coming up, and I'm trying to I'm I'm traveling much more lighter than I usually do for my camera gear. And yeah. so yeah, I, I always travel. Whenever I travel anywhere, it's always always bring a messenger bag to throw a couple lenses in. So you don't want to you don't want to walk around in the backpack. It's unless you're like landscape or hiking or something like that. So. So you're saying you're suggesting I get the like Evgeny's talking about this airport accelerator. So that'll mm -hmm. be like my main thing. That'll be like then... you haul your stuff around from place to place. Like when yeah. you're like if you're moving from a hotel room to hotel room and getting on the train or something, and That's then also base have camp. yes, and then also have like a small um everyday bag or even a small backpack or you know messenger bag. It's usually that's yeah. usually what I do. Okay. I prefer that. I like I can the... throw my little crap in yes, there. And, yes. Yeah. But okay. it really depends on your kind of like lifestyle because if you want to fly drones uh, and you don't have it with you, you don't have it, right? So. No. That's true. I, but yeah, I want to ruin true. the trip with a drone. See, because I'm a, <laughs> you know, that's the thing. You know, I want to, I want to bring the drone, but I don't. The drone, the drone is coming with me to Vietnam. I'm not going with the drone to Vietnam. <laughs> but, but trust me, every single thing that you see. From the ground, looks way more amazing from the, <laughs> from the air. When I when I see the footage from uh, from Italy, for example, and I see yeah. like the stuff that I shot on the ground and uh, the footage from the air, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm getting <laughs> one ace up. I know I'm gonna break it again. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because so you're going to Vietnam, you want to pick my brain. I'm going to Italy, so I need to pick his brain. <laughs> oh, look at that! There's a whole lot of picking going on. <laughs> yeah, a lot of picking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, guys. Before we continue our picking, uh, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about Adobe apologizing for the recent issues they had with Lightroom and how they backtracked and restored previous import functionality after its users called foul. All right, guys, we're back. Uh, like I said before the break, Adobe has apologized for Lightroom 
6.2, and they brought back the old import module. This comes to us from Petapixel and pretty much the rest of the Internet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, essentially, uh, so essentially, you know, you heard it. It's basically they pushed out an update. Tom Hogarty, who is, you know, one of the main people in charge over there at Adobe, said uh, he wrote an, a mea culpa to a user saying, hey, we pushed this thing out way too fast, and we broke our core mantra of pushing out updates in concert with our users' opinions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and as a result, they pushed out this thing that took away lots of functionality and just plain didn't work right, so the internet cried foul as they do really, really loudly, especially when you're messing with something as core as Lightroom is to many people's workflows. So people said, hey, dude, what, what are you guys doing? This is a mess. Fix it. Adobe, to their credit, and kind of unprecedentedly in, in Silicon Valley in a lot of ways, rolled back and said, okay, let's go back to what we did. We're going to fix this. But before we fix it, let's just give you what you had before. So they did that. Evgeny, you saw this whole ker kerfluffle, kind of like our scheduling kerfluffle tonight. You saw this whole thing. What, what do you think? Did Adobe do the right thing? Or as, as a person that runs a large, important company, should they have said, you know what? Suck it up, and we're you know this is the price of change. Deal with it, or go go somewhere else. Yeah, it's it's really hard one. Uh, for one, I haven't seen the new import live because again I was traveling, so the internet connection wasn't that great to upload the um, the new Lightroom, which I think was uh, a net positive in the end. Um, but frankly, you're right; it is kind of unprecedented for a big company to. Uh, roll back the changes. Totally. Yeah. Um, like Apple, Apple would have said, "What? I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't. I don't care what you're saying. This is Final Cut Pro 10." I, I, I think they have a quote for that. You're holding it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a feature, not a bug. Right? Yeah. yeah, and, and it, it, well, it really depends on the company because, for one, for Lightroom, it's it's kind of, it's currently cloud software, so you kind of mm -hmm. like really this is your critical workflow. But it's it doesn't belong to you anymore. You rent right. it for for a fee each month, um, and I think that's kind of like makes the change why why they rolled it back. Because if this is a critical piece of software that you make your money or your living off, or even if you're an artist and you make your art uh, off that, you want it to work the way you like it. Yeah. Uh, and you want or at least the way that you've been accustomed to it working. Right, because yeah. you want to know about the changes coming. So yeah. if that's a critical piece of your software that's in the cloud, you probably want to have uh, a bit of control. Because imagine before, right, you would buy uh, a version of Photoshop out, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And people would get, you know, they would stick with their, like, CS5 for years because that's what they're used to. Uh, not just, for, well, partially because of the cost, but big part because they were used to everything, uh, all the presets and actions and whatever and buttons and everything. So they wouldn't switch for many, many years. And now with the cloud cycle, you know, you get updates whenever Adobe feels that they have something to release. Yeah. So uh, I think that's cha uh, that changes the dy dynamic. And uh, if would it be the offline software it was before, uh, there would be no rollback. It would be like a new version of Lightroom, and you just this is what you get when you upgrade, basically. Yeah. When you pay. Yeah, it's pay. scary though. I mean, you hit it right on the head. This the we're in the age of cloud and things kind of changing dynamically and constantly, kind of like the clouds do, right? So so what happens is you know, it would be kind of like Tesla. Right, Elon Musk pushing out an update to all Teslas that now, when you turn the car counterclockwise, instead of it turning left, it turns right. You know, <laughs> you're like, you're like, but dude, I just need to get to work. Stop with the changes. You know, I just, you know, if they did something that fundamental, it's, I mean, not that Adobe, what Adobe did will, you know, cause deaths or anything, but it was kind of that fundamental, and you'd think that it was that critical from the outcry from the internet, Nicole. You use Lightroom, mm -hmm. right? When you, you did, you get impacted by this bug. Uh, yeah. So 
I actually I usually update right away. Like when I Me see too, yeah. a little thing, I update, update. And <laughs> for some reason, I just held it off a little bit. And mm -hmm. my husband Brian Matias, he updated his uh, version to the new one, and it was crashing, it was crashing, it was crashing. So I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, I think I'm gonna hold off on updating if mm -hmm. it's actually giving people problems. So. Uh, and then he was talking about the import dialogue, and I hadn't even gotten to it yet. Um, but, you know, finally they fixed the bugs. So I was like, all right, it's time to update. I updated, and I actually, I don't mind the, imp sorry, just a second. I'm hearing an echo somewhere. I hear that, too. I'm, not, I'm not sure where that's coming from, but I'm hearing there, it a little bit, too. Just an echo. Okay, sorry about that. I can't, I'm like one of those people who can't talk if I keep hearing my own echo back and forth. So, so I updated to uh, the new version, and I, I don't, I can adapt really easily. <laughs> I there are some things I do miss that eject on import because I use that all the time. And now I keep uh, I keep pulling my card out of the reader when after it's imported, and I get the little notice like you just did not eject properly. And I'm like, oh, it's because I'm used to that auto eject thing. Um, but you know, I I have to say I applaud Adobe for listening to their customer base, not necessarily for changing and rolling it back because that's not always a guarantee that they're going to do something as big as that. But definitely for listening. And in this case. Uh, I'm sure they saw all of the feedback, and they, you know, I saw just a few people uh, post, you know, on on Facebook or wherever they were complaining about the new import. Um, but they really took it to heart, and they they probably got some info input from people they really respected, and they changed it. And I think that's really great that they're listening to people. Uh, it, so it's it's really hard to say. Like I said, I, I'm one of those people I can adapt to new things very easily, mm -hmm. but don't take my features away from me. If you're gonna give me something. Don't take it away. <laughs> Give right. it, make it optional, uh, um, unless it's like so completely obsolete that it's not uh, even used, and it takes so much energy to continually adding it to new versions. But uh, taking features away is a no-no. It's you know, it, but you know, people don't like change in general. Like Yevgeny learned with the whole logo, and that was just a logo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. but even there's change. I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm nodding my head to, to almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's change for. You know, in this for the sake of progress, which is I'm all for. Like you, Nicole, I'm like, okay, oh, this is different. They're pushing, a, they're pushing the envelope. That's called innovation in technology, right? <laughs> yeah. We do here in Silicon Valley. Um, but then there's change for change sake, right? So there's like, okay, we got to change something, and we have this long laundry list of features, and we need to get these into the next release. No one's really asking for them, but we're gonna put these in anyway because like Steve Jobs said they don't know what they don't, what they need right so you know there's there's a fine line in there but I think when you cross the line I think and I'm with you Nicole I I applaud Adobe for for being taking the high road and making this change and rolling back but when you when you when you push a change like this forward and it affects the fundamental workflow and incomes I mean you're, I'm sure they cost people money you know with this you know, because they're running their entire business and livelihoods on Lightroom in a lot of ways, right? So when you when you start messing with that fundamentally, then people get pissed off. Like I said, in the case of Tesla, it's like, you know, you're changing the fundamental operation of the car. You're not just giving me a new UI to Google on my flat, my, my 17 inch screen in the car. Mm -hmm. You're changing the fundamental way of how the car works. You know, that is when people get, you know, a little pissed yeah. off. It's also an issue of not, like, a lot of people who use Lightroom are, I guess, I don't know, power users. There are a lot of power users out there, people who use it. Like, I understand the entire dialogue window when, when the import thing comes up. I don't necessarily use everything, but I understand it. Mm -hmm. And when all of a sudden it's, like, scaled back, it's kind of like the Apple scenario. Like, we're, you know, a lot of us who are really hardcore Apple users or we, we really like our Apple systems, we worry that Apple is changing it to a consumer-based product, and eventually oh. all they're going to have are iPads with keyboards, you know? I don't want that. I want to keep my iMac or a Mac Pro or whatever pro level version they have you know we don't want the same thing to happen to software like Lightroom because that's such a powerful software a lot of people use it and unfortunately things like this kind of push people away and people are looking for other alternatives mm -hmm. and I mean because there are things are growing uh, now I probably will never switch because I just like Adobe products I'm really in you know immersed in them I have a lot of other things I use with them and I just like it and I, I'm really good with change, but I, when you like something and you use it, you, sometimes you just don't want to change. <laughs> so, yeah, and you 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 go with the flow. You're yeah. like, ah, okay, that, exactly. that's not so good, but I'm going to keep using it anyway. Yeah, it takes a I lot to push me off course. <laughs> right. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, the we need 
I mean, I love Adobe too. You know, I'm using, I use their products religiously. I use Macs, all this stuff. You know, so I'm, I'm in the fold there. But you're right. There's a lot of really cool, and we're going to do a whole show on this because there's all this other cool, really capable software out there from Mac Fun, from On One, from Google, from I mean, it goes on and on. There's lots of alternatives out there to people that don't want to a pay Adobe subscription fees or b don't agree with the business model or how the software operates or the mm -hmm. cloud thing because of these types of changes. So, which is good for the industry overall. You don't want to be. You don't want to live in a world where the the only viable solution to a problem is one company, right? Because mm -hmm. then that company gets lazy yeah. and you're beheld to them and their customer support won't pick up the phone and now you're screwed, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so change change is good and options are good, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'm I'm with you. I think you know the power that I have in the Adobe suite is like the, what I need is like this, you know, mm -hmm. is like a, like two inches long. And what they provide is like a yeah. mile long, right? And yeah. I don't think I could ever grow into that mile for the things that <laughs> I need to do. So, yeah, I don't know. It's all good. You've any so post processing on your side, the stuff that you're doing. Like, what are you? Uh, what What are you using post processing wise? Yeah, well, it's mostly Lightroom. Um, though I'm kind of like exploring other options, um, like uh, MacFun and On One software. Uh, and I really want to get into the Capture One, you know, workflow. So it's kind of like a bunch of things. Uh, I'm really surprised about the health uh, of the competition uh, and kind of like a new companies uh, cropping up and building really nice tools either on top of Lightroom and Photoshop um, or building a whole new set of tools altogether. So this is something that I think it's kind of like uh, pretty healthy for the industry, so it's yeah. nice, nice to see all around. But yeah, I just like to explore things, uh, like to see new, um, new tools. So constantly trying something new, even if yeah. they, do, if it doesn't stick, I just want to see like what's, you know, what's out there, basically. Yeah. No. No, I agree. Yeah, that's we're all we're all three of us are the same people in terms of like you know being geeks and wanting to try new stuff. <laughs> so, so I love trying new stuff too. All right, guys, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the NPAA suing the state of Wyoming for threatening photographers' rights with a recent law that criminalizes data collection, data collection, read pixels, in open land. All right, guys, we're back. We're going to dive into story number three here. So the National Press Photographers Association, a.k.a. NPPA, announced this week that it has joined in on a new lawsuit filed against the state of Wyoming over uh, recent laws that criminalize data collecting on open land. So among other things, the NPAA, or NPPA, sorry, is arguing that the laws put photojournalists on the wrong end of the law for legitimate work. So we talked about this back in May. This was called the Data Trespass Law, and it was allegedly pushed forward by the powerful ranch community or ranching community in Wyoming. And this is a group that is said to have an interest in covering up the fact that many streams in the state have been contaminated by E. coli from their grazing cows. And I want to, I want to, highlight allegedly. So we don't know that for sure, but this is this is what we're reporting. And all of this comes to us from Petapixel. And the law that they're putting forth makes it a crime for people to collect resource data, for example, photography, from open land if the person intends on submitting that data to a federal or state agency. So they're saying, that's so funny, they're saying, if you take pictures on open land here, and you just and your your reason for taking that photo is to put it somewhere that might do us harm and tell on us that's illegal. So photographers immediately reached into the law, arguing that it's overreaching. You think in terms of infringing upon photographers' rights. So the NPPA says that the laws are written so expansively that they could even be interpret, interpreted to criminalize submission of photographs to the National Park Service from some popular tourist sites like the Grand Tetons, Devil's Tower, and one of my favorite places, Yosemite National Park. Uh, Nicole, we, you know, we... <laughs> What do you think about this? You, know, you do some landscape photography. I've mm -hmm. seen some of your amazing shots all over the place. 
it, like, the, <laughs> what do you think? I mean, it's just crazy. What do you think? I think it's I think it's a lobbyist who got you know is working with a person up on the hill who is trying to keep their business up and yeah, doesn't like yeah. that people are potentially getting them in trouble for things they're doing wrong. That's that's how I see this. And I, it's it's ridiculous. If you're on, if you're on public property, you can take any picture as long as you're not photographing into somebody's house or something like that, you know, and through a window. And this is obviously not even in near that type of uh, scenario. So it's it's ridiculous. You know, people could take innocent photographs and then post them on Facebook and get in trouble. <laughs> Unless, um, but what is the intent to you know? What does they say? The the intent to uh, give them to a federal organization or whatever. I don't know. I think it's ridiculous, and it I, is, I it's completely ridiculous. And I'm, well, I'm I'm still scratching my head about it because I'm thinking, <laughs> like, in in this country or in any country, can you legislate like <laughs> like the usage of of a photo? Like, Evgeny, like you see this, right? You're like, okay, it's okay. Like I could say it's okay if you come stand in my front yard and take photos. Let's say my front yard is a national park that's publicly <laughs> accessible. You can come stand in my front yard and take pictures of deer, but if you decide to use those deer in a magazine that is not vegan, assuming you're saying I'm a vegetarian, but it's not vegan, then that's prohibited. But you can use them for other things. I mean, like, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, but it's been used, uh, I think, in a similar sense before. So, for example, if you take, um, you know, private photos of someone without their consent, and you keep them to yourself without telling anyone, chances mm -hmm. are you will not be prosecuted. But if you decided to sell them to, um, you know, to some kind of magazine or something, uh, you can be prosecuted for infringing on... The yeah, that's expectation of privacy, though. Right, 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 right. On public land. I could see if Justin Bieber were standing in Yellowstone National Park and I was taking pictures of him, that would be a different why, conversation. Why do you always have to pick on Canadians? <laughs> hey, he's an easy Canadian to pick on. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> but... You know, Justin Bieber standing there versus... We will have know, to ship Nickel back to, uh, to you as well. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> but, it, but, but seriously, if I'm taking pictures of, of him, a celebrity in, in Yellowstone, versus, right. you know, a, a, you know a, some wildlife right. out there. Yeah. Frankly, my take on that, uh, I see a lot of stupid laws uh, a, a lot of the time, especially when you read uh, on them in the news or some kind of, like, uh, blogs. What I'm concerned is that do we are we even going to see any cases of that? Mm -hmm. And if there is not a single case of that happening, you know, the law is there, but it's so ridiculous that nobody ever wants to actually go in court with that and fight that. Uh, so for me, that that's a pretty important distinction. So it, it, it could be an overreaching law, and it could be uh, ridiculous, but if n no one ever... Uh, goes to court and tries to either fine or some kind of like uh, tries to stop you from sharing those photos, then who cares, right? Like, yeah. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot of obsolete laws that are still out there uh, in every country in the world, and they just they're just not enforced. So I think that's it's scary, though. I mean, that's like th that's like saying, you know, we know Facebook's terms of service says that they have access to your firstborn for <laughs> the first five years, but they'll never act on it, so it doesn't really matter. But it's they still wrote it in there. You know, that's 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 a scary way of thinking, right? Cause have you ever read Apple's terms of service? I'm afraid to. No, no. <laughs> have you? <laughs> There's probably something in there about your firstborn. <laughs> I know. Hey, I know some people that'd be okay with that. So. <laughs> do, do, dogs don't cat in that scenario, do they? Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh man. Yeah, yeah. but but I, I think it's part of the uh, you know the politics and the part that I usually hate commenting on because it's just it just seems to be that that uh, that's what they like to do: enact some laws and then. Uh, uh, revoke those laws and then enact some more law laws and then revoke some more laws and yeah. just kind of like that keeps them busy for for their whole life basically. I wonder how this would like say put, let's put this in practice right let's say 
Let's let, and let's weave the whole show together, right? So the first story was about drone legalization, right? So let's say I go to Yosemite National Park, I bring my brand new Phantom Three professional out there, which is illegal, by the which way, because illegal. it's a national yeah. park to yeah. begin with. So I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> let's let's just say that I did that. You know, I'm flying around Yosemite or Yellowstone rather with this with this drone, and I'm taking photos, you know, from the air um, with the with the camera on the thing. Um, those photos that I take, say a portion of them, I decide, you know, I'm just going to put them on Facebook or I'm going to make a gallery, I'm going to put them online. But then there's one or two that, you know, the, this, this, these people that are suing the, the farmers out there, the ranching community in Wyoming, they say, oh, that's a perfect shot. That demonstrates E. coli from their <laughs> grazing evil cows, right? And they want that shot of the evil E. coli spreading cows, you know, that I took from my theoretical quadcopter, and I give it to them. Now what? So now does that mean that I'm liable for suit and that they're going to come after me? Or does that mean in Yevgeny land that they're not going to come after me because it was just kind of written in there, you know? Yevgeny, what do you think? I think you should better hire a really good lawyer. <laughs> 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 like first of all, count one: illegally operating an aircraft <laughs> on, in state park land. Count two: violating this data trespass law. All and, right, and probably just agree to the uh, to the lowest uh, minimum sentence or to the lowest fine that you can get. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah that that would be not a conversation that I want to have in jail. About, you know, trying to look trying to look hard. You know, like, hey, hey, man, what are you in here for? Uh, yeah, the dude, dude over there is in for murder. He's in for tax evasion. <laughs> and this guy was flying a drone in Yellowstone. <laughs> I took a picture of a cow. <laughs> yeah, Taking a shot of a cow grazing. Yeah. That, that <laughs> it was a beautiful be photo. <laughs> yeah. It would not be good. Not be good. I don't know. It's it's scary. I mean, all this stuff. You're right, Evgeny. You know, you're if they wanted to prosecute, if in that hypothetical situation, they could they could lock me up, right? Because I broke the law and probably knowingly after, especially after recording this episode. Nicole, <laughs> what, what, what about you? In that hypothetical situation, what, what do you think would go down? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I would make sure that I license the photo of them for a lot of money so I could afford the legal fees. <laughs> if you, you come out zero or like five bucks ahead. Yeah, after exactly, <laughs> exactly. And hopefully not too much time wasted. <laughs> I know. It's crazy. And you know what? You'd make you'd make news, so yeah. it'd probably bring awareness to the whole situation and how ridiculous it is. And yeah, so uh, I'd become a martyr, basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it just kind of, I think the whole thing just makes them look suspicious. It's like yeah. it's like a, it's like a criminal saying, you know, there's a law now. You can't take pictures of criminals doing criminal activity. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> At all. Legal, like, just in case but, they... uh, yeah, everything's legal, but you know, we know we're not supposed to be fracking on this land, <laughs> so don't take any. Photos of people fracking on this land is illegal. <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. Come on. Yeah. If there's no trespassing involved, then there's there's no there should be no no issue at all. They they should be able to do whatever they want. So Yeah. No, I agree. All right guys, we're gonna take a our, our last break here. When we come back, we're gonna tackle some listener Q and A. All right, it's time for some listener Q and A. This week's question is from Tony Froud. And Tony says I would like to know how you manage your Lightroom catalog with two computers, one desktop and one laptop for travel. I currently do all of my edits on a 13-inch MacBook Pro with an external drive, but would like to get something larger like an iMac to edit on when I'm at home and maybe host all of my images on a NAS, which is a network attached storage, or a cloud system. How do you guys handle multiple computers with the single Lightroom catalog? Hmm, Nicole, I have a feeling you might do this from time to time. What do you well, think? Well, I actually, I don't, I handle multiple computers. I have yeah. my iMac, and I also have uh, my laptop. Mm -hmm. um, I use the 
Creative Cloud, you know, Lightroom and all that. But I don't use one catalog for all of that. Uh, so a good example is I was just visiting my family in Nebraska, and I brought my laptop with me, brought my camera gear, and it's basically kind of like a, I consider it like my travel Lightroom catalog. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I, I took pictures of my nephews and my nieces, put my photos onto my laptop, and I just import them just like I normally would into that catalog. And I still actually haven't done this yet, so I'm reminding myself. <laughs> I'm going to take that laptop and connect it to my iMac, and there's you can just do it with the lightning cable, and then open it as basically like a hard drive. And just basically, I'm just going to relocate that cat all of that catalog, export it as a catalog, import it as a catalog. So I'm basically just importing the photos from one catalog to another catalog. Yeah. And that's how I manage it. Um, if I need photos, to, if I need to access photos for, let's say, I'm, I, oh, I need to write this blog post and I forgot to write it, I'm going to travel and I know what photos I'm going to use, I put those into a collection in my, uh, in, the, in Lightroom and I sync it to cloud and then I use the, uh, my phone. Actually, I sync it, it to the what's it called, the Lightroom mobile app on my yeah. phone. So yeah. that's how I access. If I need, if I have some photos I need to access, or like sometimes I have photos I share to Instagram, and their photos I took a few months ago have that on my Lightroom catalog. Uh, in a, sorry, in a collection that just syncs to my phone. Um, that unfortunately, and I hope that I really hope that they add this feature in the future. It would be great if they would kind of merge the syncable features from mobile to desktop to sync from desktop to desktop. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe at first if they ever did it, probably be like a limited capacity. But um, so anyways, so bottom line, my answer is I don't just work off of one catalog. I do back at home. I have like my main catalog and then I have like a travel catalog. And I just I work don't, exa I'm, I'm exactly yeah. the same. I, I, do exactly I don't the same. even know. I, I'm sure that there's a Lightroom guru out there who, you know, lives and breathes Lightroom and they probably have an answer on how to do this. I don't know if Lightroom is really made to work off of like a network or a cloud based system. It'd be kind of I'd be a little afraid to do it, and maybe it's just like the old-fashioned Adobe person in me, you know, not wanting to to get too much into like networks and stuff because of there's so many moving parts with everything. Um, yeah. I'd worry that the database would somehow get confused about where things are located if a file or a folder gets renamed or just has a you know something, then everything kind of gets a little question mark. So, yeah, I keep it pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a fan sure. of that. Yeah, less yeah. is more, and less complexity and fewer mm -hmm. steps is always better. I'm the same way. I mean, I have a, I have an iMac here, which is my workstation in my little home office here, and then I have a 13-inch MacBook Pro like Tony has, and I'm like you, Nicole. I have a, I have a my shuttlecraft, yep. <laughs> you know, Lightroom <laughs> library that goes with me, and I'll do edits on that. But it's always temporary. Yep. When I'm done with doing my little work on there that stuff gets imported back into my main system here, which I call the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So that gets, <laughs> that gets stuck back into the Library of Congress for safekeeping, and then I start fresh again on, yeah. the, on the portable, which has limited SSD storage, obviously. Yeah, so, the, the key thing to that is that there, you can do all the edits you want on your photos. On, if you do it that way, whatever's on your, on your laptop, I have the same exact same setup with a 13-inch MacBook Pro, if I make a bunch of edits and do all sorts of things, all of those changes, if I if I do it properly, you basically you export it as a catalog, yep. <laughs> and then you import it as a catalog, and then you just yep. move the files. That's all you have to do. Um, you don't even have to you don't have to re-edit your photos. So no. yeah, that's all how the I work. Go with them. I, yeah. yeah. So so then on my downtime, like when I when I was in Iceland and Norway, I I had we had a lot of downtime, just kind of sitting around, you know. I didn't say a lot, but we we had some downtime. So I'm like, oh, let me edit a bunch of my photos, merge my panos, merge my HDRs, and I didn't have a lot to do when I got home. So it's it was kind of nice just to be able to do that while I was on the road and thinking about it. Yeah, you have a supercomputer with you, right? So mm -hmm. why not, why not yeah. do it on the road with you? Yevgeny, what about you, man? What's your what's your flow? You're always on the road. How do you manage the uh, your images? I just have one computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you solved it. <laughs> No more syncing, nothing. Just one computer. Yeah. But I, but I heard the rumor that um, uh, that some use Dropbox for their catalog, mm. and then you can access that uh, basically like point that uh, on your iMac or any other computer, and it's just gonna work there. So your your mm -hmm. your photos can be somewhere else. They can be on an external hard drive, for example. Yeah. Uh, but your catalog, which is lighter, uh, could be just in uh, in your Dropbox, for example. Yeah, we probably want to check with Tom Hogarty and the Adobe <laughs> folks on that because I have a feeling they, if they're listening to this, they're going to be like, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's asking for trouble with database corruption. and Well, all that. Yeah. If, if they don't support it officially, they'll probably have to do it by Friday when the episode... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, Dropbox, however, Dropbox is a good place to back up your catalog. If, you know, if you don't... And then maybe you could access that when you're on the road. Just Depending so. on how much space you've paid for with Dropbox. True. <laughs> I have, like, cause... too much space on my Dropbox, so... Yeah, I've got a ton too, but uh, I don't know. You know, but it goes back to that other issue. Like, like when we started the show, Nicole, we're using this cloud service to do um, offline recording, mm -hmm. but that service was down. So now, oh, but that's why it wouldn't load for me. <laughs> yeah, that's why it wouldn't load for you. And and now we ha we don't have a backup for the show. Oh, See, I know. But even this show, even with the Hangouts, we're reliant on the cloud True. for this, you know? So yeah, as we do will you know. really <laughs> want to put your Lightroom cloud, your library, in the cloud, too? <laughs> you know? be, yeah, I, I hope I didn't, you know, I was in that one where it just kind of disappeared off the face of the earth, so. Yeah, yeah, you remember that? Yeah. I, I do, that's, like, that's probably why you're doing the backup now. <laughs> exactly, and now we don't have a backup because yes. that is wow. now down. It was See, me, it was me. I did like it. Chasing, <laughs> we're, we're chasing the horizon with this show. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> All right, I think I think that was a good good answers all around. Nicole and I do the same thing. Evgeny has solved the synchronization issue by not syncing at all. <laughs> having, <laughs> having one one computer. All right, listeners, if you have a question you'd like us to tackle in the show, just visit us at thisweekinphoto.com. Click on that submit a question link and send us your question. Or you can also tweet us through uh, our Facebook or through Twitter, obviously, or hit us up on Facebook. We're there as well. All right, we're going to end the show with our picks of the week. Remember, you guys can pick anything to recommend to the TWIP folks as long as it is somehow related to photography. Nicole, I'm going to let you go first. Sure. What's your pick of the week? I have two. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. All right. My first one is a birthday present that my husband got me. Ooh. And he bought it for me because it's a bag, the MindShift Gear Backlight 26L. Oh, and, and we know how photographers he, hate bags, right? I <laughs> Many bags. Um, he bought one for himself, and I looked at it, and I was like, "Ooh, <laughs> it looks really nice." Uh, I use the f-stop gear bags a lot when I do a lot of my landscape photography because I really like the way that you can, like, if you're wearing the the waist strap, you can flip the bag around, and then the zipper is on the basically the part that touches your back. It's on that side, so you can flip it up and then access your gear without having to set your bag on the floor. Um, I really, really like that setup. Uh, the the F-stop bags, though, however, they have some things that I, I think are missing. Like, there's not a dedicated laptop space. So you don't really have a padded area to put your laptop or other, uh, you know, like, accessories like that. Uh, however, this new MindShift bag is kind of like the answer to... It's like a nice blend of a, a MindShift think tank bag, travel bag, and the F-stop bag, where it's a really good size. I, I just used it, actually, yesterday and today for the first time. Um, but it has a lot of space in it. It has, you know, the, the way that it flips out is the way that I really prefer. Um, it has a, sp a spot just for a laptop and an iPad and, like, other pockets. And it has a pocket that's so deep that an entire water bottle fits in it instead of just, like, half of it. So then you're worried, you know, the water bottle is going to fall out, etc. You stick your tripod on it. Uh, it's, it's a, like, it's, it could be the perfect bag for, really? like, backpack bag. It's, oh, it's really, really, really close. Check. It's really, really close. And, you know, I've, I'm going to take it with me when I go to Italy. It's going to be my bag that I haul things around with, and then I'm going to use a messenger bag for the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, but I'm, yeah, so that's has a really good potential for being a really good bag. Um, I believe my husband did a, a video review on it. He may have, I shouldn't say anything because I'm not sure if he did it or not, but... I'll look it up, and if I did, maybe you guys I think he wanted to, but I he think wanted it's, to. Not, it's not live yet. <laughs> oh, it's not live yet. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I'll have to ask him. So, anyway. Did, yeah. Uh, All right. It's actually, I think, one of my uh, uh, bags on my wish list as well, because I've been bag. using Mindshift bag, uh, the uh, uh, the smaller one and the bigger one than this, mm -hmm. uh, the rotation ones. And they're really good, but I'm really eager to just kind of like uh, spice things up and try something <laughs> different. Um, so we'll see if I'm going to get it or not, uh, because I think I have too many bags. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh man, tell me about it. I just gave a bag to my friend because I was like, take it, I have too many. And it was like a brand new bag. Um, Okay, so that's my first one. Highly recommend if you're into that, you know, if, if, if it's a bag, the size of the bag suits your need, then it's a really good bag. Light, comfortable, etc. My second one, and I think I may have done this one last time, is the new On One Photo 10. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it's going to be released by the end of the month, and so I, I love On One software. I um, use it all the time, and I'm really excited for it. So I just wanted to push it out there. They're, you know, they're upgrading to the next big version. 
Yeah, and I mean, that goes along with what we were talking about before, with there are other softwares yeah, out they, there that yeah. are amazing, with amazing teams behind them that are building stuff, so... Yeah, they're yeah. We we all love Adobe, but yeah, don't don't go through life with blinders on. Try other stuff and exactly check out the other things out there too. All right. So that's that's Photo Ten coming. You know what that yeah. what that's going to cost when it comes out, Nicole? Uh, off the top of my head, the upgrade price is eighty nine dollars, and I think it's one hundred nineteen for the full version. Like, so if you okay. don't have on one, then you pay the full version. Uh, but that's you know, you, it's it's just pay it and you and then you have the the software, and I believe you get the the dot upgrades throughout the year as they you know. We come out with the improving, taking bugs out and all that stuff um, yeah. that comes with any kind of new software that comes out. So but they're like revamping the entire interface, so it's going to look, it looks good. It looks, I've been working on the beta and it looks really good. So um, right. yeah, I'm excited for it. All right. So much stuff to try. So <laughs> I know. I might download with download that and play with it on the plane on my way to Vietnam. There you go. There you go. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Perfect. Yevgeny, what is your pick of the week? Well, I'll have to as well. Uh, I'll start with a simple one. So on my trip, I've been extensively using the app that many many of the landscape photographers would know. It's called Photo Pills. Um, Photo Pills, yeah. Basically, the feature that I was using is where the sunset and uh, sunrise are. Uh, really useful for planning, uh, you know, depending on the weather, depending on the location spot that you pick. So I, I downloaded that the first time when I was in Iceland, but I haven't used it a lot uh, and started using it quite a bit on my last two trips. So it, I think it was really useful for people who are willing to wake up really early uh, and stay up late for sunsets. Mm -hmm. So um, photo pills in the App Store. Uh, I don't know if they have the Android version, but they definitely have the one for iPhone. Cool. I love that app. That has so many things you can use. Like, my newest favorite thing in that is the hyperfocal table. Cool. <laughs> it's, it's such a dorky, geeky landscape thing, but so, yeah. All right. I'm going I'm to download that right after the show. You don't have it yet? I do not. Oh, it's, it's pricey. <laughs> is it? How much is that? I don't remember. I think like 12 bucks or 13 bucks. Oh, man. I don't, oh, know I don't remember. I so I remember it was one of the pricier it's, apps that I got, but... Uh, it's worth it, though. Yeah, I guess it's worth it, yeah. It is worth yeah. it. All right. Hey, if you guys recommend it, then it's worth it. So. <laughs> yeah. And the second pick is the small photo sharing website that you might know um, called Fire and PX. <laughs> so just want to throw know, it out. You, you know you're going to go blind if you do that too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> just want to throw it out there. We have a lot of uh, interesting announcements coming up. So Nicole's probably aware of some of them. Uh, you know, we had our major redesign uh, just a few. I think we rolled it out last week to, for everyone. Uh, but we've been testing and we've been rolling out features um, every week or so. We did a major logo redesign, and there is a major, major announcement. Uh, for our next expansion into China. Uh, so that is going to be happening in the next uh, few days and few weeks. So uh, basically brings a whole new audience to, um, to photographers. Uh, really for a lot of other networks, as I mentioned, like almost every other social network, whether it's photo or video or uh, just a social network, they are blocked in China. Um, so only a small fraction of users access those through VPN, and it's like it's extremely slow. So we're building something that's going to be fast for local users, uh, for all 1.4 billion uh, Chinese customers that are out there. Um, so it's pretty exciting um, to opening this uh, this up to you know to the world. That that's I mean congratulations first of all, but that's. Um, I know you can't share this, but I, when you say one point, would you say how many billion? One point what? It's one point thirty-six to be 1. exact. One point three six billion <laughs> potential new customers to five hundred px. That's uh, that's kind of cool, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially considering that it's almost as going to be an exclusive uh, way for people to be present in China. So wow. when I was in China, uh, none of the Chinese people use any of the apps that we know. They, like, everything they use is local, is made for uh, their market. The, the forest sharing apps they use uh, is nothing that we know here. Yeah. Um, the messaging apps uh, that, we, that they use is nothing that we use here. 
um, unless you're obviously an, uh, like a Chinese person to k keep in touch with the uh, with the relatives or friends over there. So it's a huge, huge opportunity to actually bring something of an international brand, however small. I mean, like uh, you know, obviously, Foreign PX is not too global just yet. Yeah. Uh, but kind of like bring it over to much bigger community than uh, than we have right now. Now, what is when you were over there? Did you get a sense for like the the pro? I know you didn't probably didn't do a, a formal survey, but just anecdotally looking around, what kind of phones were people using? Was it Android? Was it iOS? What did, what did you see? Uh, in major, well, I was in major cities, so like in places like Hong Kong and Shanghai, uh, it's all the major phones. So like iPhone, when 6s came out, everybody was was with uh, 6s the, basically the next hour <laughs> as they were <laughs> as they went on sale. Uh, but a lot of regular folks they have uh, different versions of Android phones. Yeah. Uh, but majority, like basically everybody over 20 has a smartphone of sorts, whether it's uh, a cheaper Android phone or a more expensive iPhone. Uh, they're really plugged in into the uh, app, uh, like ecosystem out there. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just that for Android phones, it's uh, local Android stores. Um, and luckily, our app is present in local Android stores as well. So it's kind of like uh, it's out there for the consumers to, uh, you know, to be and see. Wonderful. Cool. All right, guys. Uh, we're, we're at the end of another episode of This Week in Photo. Yevgeny, you're on a roll. We're, uh, I mean, we know 500 PX, right? So other than that, or maybe that's it. Where should people go to connect to connect with you and and see what you're working on? Um, okay, I'll I'll change things a bit. I started using Instagram after about three year break. Oh. Uh, because I've been using our corporate uh, company Instagram account for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, and I get kicked out of that because now we are using that more professionally. So in a sense to promote our community instead of uh, my, you know, pictures, <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I think is fair. So uh, I, uh, I, I was glad that that happened finally, that we have the capacity to, uh, you know, to bring it back to the community. So I'm now at um, Instagram as at Chibotrio, so basically my last name. And uh, I be, I'll be posting a few pictures there. So, cool. Yeah. Awesome. Follow yeah, me. we'll definitely point to pe point people there. And I'll, I don't know if I'm following you, but I'll, I will be after the show. Perfect. <laughs> All right, and thanks for coming on, man. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Likewise. All right, Nicole, what about you? What do you've got coming up in the coming months and work at, well, we're in where can people find you and all that stuff? Oh, yeah. Well, you can find me on my website. I, everything's linked from there. It's just uh, nicolesy.com. It's N-I-C-O-L-E-S-Y. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much Nicolesy everywhere else on social media. Um, yeah, the next couple of months, I've got a uh, trip to Italy coming up. I'm, my husband and I are attending a workshop by David Dushman in Venice. Oh, so right. really yeah, excited. Up. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a week in Venice and then a week and we're not exactly sure. <laughs> we should probably figure out our plans because it's in like two weeks. But uh, yeah, so that's happening. And then I'm uh, working on an ebook. I should have it released hopefully before the end of the year. And yeah. That's, hey, what's that's, what's the ebook on? Can you tell us? Yeah, it's on. Uh, it's actually I have it on my website already on my in my store. It's just a coming soon product. Uh, it's called Waterfalls and Waves, and it's going to be on long exposure waterfall water photography type stuff. So oh, photography, cool. post processing. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. I yeah, love always, always. I love that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to teach what I love too. So it's kind of a you know. Hey, you know what's love. interesting? This is this is geeky, and Yevgeny, you'll appreciate this. I was talking to uh, to uh, Eric Chang the other day um, before this Back to the Future thing that I'll be talking to <laughs> in a couple of days. But he and I were talking over lunch, and he was telling me that did you know that with with I think the Phantom Three and maybe the Inspire that it can do a three to eight second exposure perfectly registered to the sub-pixel level while in flight. <laughs> yes, but he is not correct because in actual tests that my friends uh, made, it's about half a second. Really? But, oh, but, man. Oh. But, but it is still pretty cool because you can get... Uh, you can... Uh, so, okay, I, I guess I can reveal the secret. Uh, we are thinking of doing the time-lapse drone photography based wow. based on actually this uh, feature. Uh, and it could be like in uh, post-evening blue hour, 
uh, time lapse in the series. Uh, and so don't steal that idea. Yeah, that's <laughs> we, cool. <laughs> we want to do something first, but but basically it is possible, and I think we will see a whole new set of uh, movies and uh, and videos that are using. Uh, uh, time lapse and combine uh, I, I, you know if you've seen some time lapse and drone movies they're usually drones and time lapses but yeah. never combined into one so yeah. that might be the next frontier for a for new that genre. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah a new genre is born you know what now that I think of it he may have been speaking specifically about the um, the Osmo that handheld one up to eight oh. seconds mm. so I think he was saying like three seconds in the air. Um, but the Osmo, the handheld gimbal mm-hmm. camera video thing, I think that one can lock in and go for eight seconds for an eight-second exposure, which might make a good chapter in your book, Nicole. I'm just saying. <laughs> for water? I don't know. Yeah, I need to get water. one of those. <laughs> Blowing water handheld. Imagine that. Yeah, it's crazy. We live, in, we live in crazy times. You know, <laughs> it's uh, we're living in science fiction. All right, guys, we're, uh, we're at the end of the show. I want to thank our sponsors for making this show happen, and that's our good friends over at Backblaze, FreshBooks, Audible, and iFi. And uh, listeners, again, be sure to check out our website at thisweekinphoto.com. Tons of episodes for you to check out there, as well as tons of interviews and other shows that we produce. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. Perfect. (laughs) Holy Nicole can do that. (laughs) 